Will democracy survive in the next couple of years? And essentially we are the same. And there are so many needs that Minnesota has. What people are saying they need right now. Access to democracy is made possible by donations from the following organizations. Thomson Reuters, a global company with expertise and insight to unravel complex situations in the areas of law, tax, compliance, government, and media. Their worldwide network of journalists and editors keep customers up to speed on relevant global events. Thomson Reuters, the answer company. Crutchfield Dermatology, a full-service treatment center in Medispa in Egan. Their goal is to help you look good and feel great with beautiful skin. With service built around courtesy, dignity, and respect, Mayo-trained Dr. Charles Crutchfield personally treats each patient and is acknowledged as one of the nation's best physicians. Firefly Credit Union, with locations throughout the Twin Cities, has proudly served Minnesotans since 1925. Firefly guides its members forward by delivering customized financial solutions to improve their lives in all aspects of banking. Firefly Credit Union, they light the way with life illuminated. Edina Eye, Physicians and Surgeons, a division of Twin Cities Eye Consultants, has proudly served the Twin Cities for more than 55 years. Now in seven convenient locations, Using the most advanced technology combined with human touch, Edina Eye offers comprehensive services for dedicated specialists committed to excellence with innovative procedures and expertise for the most advanced eye care. Welcome to Access to Democracy. I'm Bill Raker, guest host for this edition of the program. We're delighted to welcome our guest today, Professor David Schultz from Hamline University. Professor Schultz works in the Department of Political Science and the Department of Legal Studies and has been a frequent guest on the program and we're delighted to have him back. I'm sure most of our viewers, uh, many of our viewers know a little bit of your background, but for those new viewers who, who do not, could you tell us a little bit about what your role is at the university and, and why you think uh, it's important to, uh, to us uh, here in Minnesota? Okay, my role, I should say, is enviable. Okay, okay. <laughs> but my role is I'm a professor of political science at Hamlin University as well as in the Department of Legal Studies. And I'm also a faculty of law at the University of Minnesota. Uh, I'm mostly interested in questions about democracy, um, questions about the inner intersection between democracy, um, let's say economics, um, and the law. And a lot of the classes and stuff that I do really talk about those interrelationships. And why should people also, know, I guess, care or want to know something about me? Um, I also teach election law. And I think occasionally, um, maybe I have something to say about, about politics, I guess. Well, I think that's great. It's a perfect background for today's theme, which is the 2020 elections. Right. And there's a lot to talk about. There's a lot going on. So let's jump right into it and uh, give us your reaction to the debate, the Las Vegas debate. Uh, what happened and uh, what difference does it make? What do you think? <laughs> okay, let's talk about why that debate was important. Okay, and the reason why that debate was important is keep in mind so far with with New Hampshire and with Iowa, only 1.6% of all the delegates for the National Convention, Democratic National Convention, have been allocated. So it's, we're talking about hardly anything. We're looking at Iowa being 86% white Caucasian, New Hampshire being 90% white Caucasian. The reason why I mention that, these are two states that are very small, maybe not necessarily representative of the United States, if not of what? of the entire country, or, the, or rather I should say of the Democratic Party. Shifting to Nevada changes the demographics. It is a state that has a higher percentage of non-white. Um, it is also a state that for many people was going to be a challenge. A challenge and an opportunity. What I mean by that, we had Bernie Sanders who wins the popular vote in the first two states. He's one delegate behind um, Mayor Peter Buttigieg in terms of the race for the nomination. We had a party going into it where people like Elizabeth Warren, who at some, one point was considered to be you know, the star, uh, but she had faded a little bit. We had um, Amy Klobuchar, who had had a good performance 
in New Hampshire um, debate, and people are thinking she has an opportunity. Biden needed to, needs, needed to do well, and we had the occurrence or the appearance of Michael, Michael Bloomberg. So you had a lot of people who all had um, reasons why they needed to do well in that debate, or, or, and if they didn't do well, it was going to hurt them. Okay. The simple thing to just say about what happened with that debate is it wasn't a debate. As I said, it was a debacle. Um, it was a horrible. It was horrible. First off, it really wasn't a debate in the sense that I didn't see too many candidates say, this is my vision, this is what I believe on a set of, set of public policies, here are my reasons, and then somebody would respond to them. Um, it was a media event. It was what Jerry Springer with shoes on, where, <laughs> where people were fighting with one another, they spent more time tearing one another down. You had these personality fights between Amy Klobuchar, Peter Buttigieg, you had Elizabeth Warren tearing down Michael Bloomberg. Michael Bloomberg giving a disastrous performance as a, as a debater. And to a large extent, somebody like what? Like Joe Biden was an afterthought. And Bernie Sanders sort of walks away from this with everybody else fighting everybody else somewhat unscathed. Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much so, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Well, La Nevada has their caucus uh, tomorrow, I guess, uh, Saturday, right? They have, it, they, have it on, they have it on Saturday, correct. Yeah, and so we'll see the results of that. But let's move from that debate and the impact that it may have on the voters here in Minnesota because come March 3rd, for the first time in decades, we're going to have a primary correct. Uh, here in the state. And uh, tell us a little bit about what the difference between a primary is, what the caucuses are, uh, why, which one is better, how this process is going to work for Minnesota, and then I want to talk about the privacy issue uh, sure. around uh, this process. Sure. Now, the last time we had a presidential primary in Minnesota was 1992. Roughly for the last, let's say, you know, tw you know, tw you know 28 years, you know, we have had a, a caucus system to pick our presidential um, delegates from the state. And what would happen, you know, a little bit of humor here, people would show up on a cold Tuesday night in February in Minnesota, um, and they would express their preferences for who they wanted to be um, the, the presidential nominee. And that was the first start, the caucuses, of a series of steps that eventually would lead up to the state convention and eventually to the national convention to help pick a nominee. Well, four years ago, the turnout was was so significant in 2016 for both part for both of the major parties, Democrat and Republican parties, that there were all kinds of concerns of what um, traffic congestion. On top of which, there were concerns that what caucuses require you to be there for several hours, um, and there's no what there's no sort of absentee voting if you can't make it at night. Um, there are people with childcare issues, people who maybe who had health problems who couldn't sort of make it there. And so for a variety of reasons, we converted over to a primary system. And in theory, the primary system is gonna be no different than any other voting. I show up on primary day, the ballots open up early in the morning. I think it's what, 6 a.m. if I remember correctly, or 7 a.m., I can't remember what it is. Um, they go till eight o'clock at night. I can show up there, I can early vote. Minnesota's been early voting for several weeks. And the hope is that this is gonna increase turnout and make it easier for people to participate. The confusion is, of course, that we're still going to have a caucus in the state anyhow. Um, we're still going to have uh, a Tuesday before the primary, we're going to have a non-presidential caucus to help pick what? All the other offices besides, um, besides president. We're still going to have um, a, a state convention. We're still going to have a non-presidential primary in August, but we're now adding to it a presidential primary. Can't get enough of politics here in Minnesota, can Oh, we? no, no, no. I, as I was going to say, you know, that, I mean, that, that, that seems to be the, the second occupation or preoccupation in Minnesota, uh, politics. Yeah. Well, a couple of issues uh, around the, the primary, the presidential primary that we're having. One is uh, the concern about the privacy of my vote. Right. Uh, and I, I believe that some people in St. Paul, the legislature is trying to, to remedy this in some way, but could you explain what the issue is, what the concern is, and what are the odds that that's going to, uh, to impact the turnout sure. 
and, and the odds of getting it, uh, getting a remedy in place before the polling starts. Sure. Now, the issue here is when the state legislature created the primary, what they also said is that in order to be able to vote in the primary, you're going to have to designate to your election judge or your election official which ballot you want. And so, for this, and so using our example here, um, we're going to have a presidential primary this year that features for the de features for the Democrats and for the Republicans. So when I show up to my local ballot, you know, my local election place, polling place, I'm going to have to say to the election judge. I am a Democrat or I'm a Republican, and if I've early voted, I had to do the same thing. And that information regarding party designation will be given to um, the parties. How I actually have voted, that is still protected. So to know whether I have voted for Sanders or Warren or whoever, that's not disclosed. No one's going to know that. That's good to know. That's good. To people are confused about that. That's right. That's right. But my party designation is and the political parties will be given that information. Like the Democrats will find out who voted Democrat, Republicans, Republican, and so forth. And the concern is that some people are saying is that, A, I don't want to have to tell my local election judge or neighbor what my party is. This is none of their business. Um, and with that, there's a concern that the parties will now um, disclose that information, will sell that, uh, will, will in some way um, make that information available to others. And so there are many people who are, who are saying that I don't really like that idea and, and maybe I won't vote in the primary. And there's a whole host of people out there um, who it's going to be a problem to do that. For example, um, for people who are journalists, they're supposed mm -hmm. to stay neutral. Casting a vote and designating party affiliation is a problem. Let's say you're a judge. Let's say you are a public employee. These are a lot of positions where a lot of people really would prefer not to have to publicly disclose. That's understandable. Yeah, it is understandable. You know, I was going to say even for people in business, for many people in business um, who know that if they were to say I'm for the Democrat or I'm from the Republican, they've probably alienated half of their customers. Uh, uh, they probably don't want. Not all of them want to really broadcast party affiliation, and so there is a concern that this disclosure of party affiliation could dampen turnout. Now, to do some comparisons here, when we had a caucus system, between 5 and 10 percent of the eligible voters in the state would show up for the caucuses, which is not a very high percentage. It's not very good. Wisconsin, which does a primary, if I, if I can use Wisconsin as a parallel here, gets about 40 to 42 percent, 43 percent turnout. Not great, but 42 percent. Better than 5. Better than 5, much more representative. Uh, I th my own my own gut intuition is telling me, if we didn't have the, the the privacy consideration there, we would be in the 40s, maybe 50 percent, because we have the highest voter turnout in the country. I don't know how many people it's going to dampen, and it's, you know, it, and it's going to discourage. Now, part of the problem is going to be just reminding people there's a primary, there's a primary, there's a primary, and how many people are going to remember there's a primary and show up and vote, and of those who do, how many of them are going to say. I'm not going to show up and cast my ballot because of that. Or how many are going to show up on election day or on primary day and someone says to them, are you a Democrat or a Republican? And that might turn a lot of people off. Right on the spot. Yep. After they've made the effort to get there, to express yeah. Their, yeah. their opinion and, and to be faced with that question. Um, well, let, let's hope the legislature can do something about it here in the short time period left. What are, you, what are your thoughts on that? I'm skeptical, but also keep in mind that even if they did, what do we do with all the people who have been early voting? Because early voting, to that. Yeah. Yeah, early voting started um, back in, um, what is it, mid-January. It's 45 right. days. And so how do we address that issue where their information has already been disclosed? Do we just basically destroy that information? Um, uh, this poses some problems here. And also, how many people were thinking, I'm going to vote? No, I got to designate I'm not going to vote and might not hear about even if the law were passed to change it. So as we stand right now, um, there is uh, no law in place that would prevent that disclosure of, again, your party affiliation if you vote at the primary. And to the best of our knowledge, the Republicans are not supportive of, of changing that law anyhow. Um, they 
feel that um, this information would be useful to them. And the, ch the chair of the Republican Party, Jennifer Carnahan, has said, no, she doesn't support the right, changing. Right. Yes. Well, let's, let's uh, explore the early voters uh, a little bit more. The, the candidates that were listed on the ballot that the early voters yeah. have is one list of candidates. Right. Is that list going to be the same on the ballot I will see on March 3rd? And if not, what could have happened in the meantime? Well, it will be the same ballot as the early people voted on, except what? Since then, we've had people like, for example, um, Yang has dropped out. Right. We have had, um, let's say, I'm trying to think through all the people we've had. Um, Castro, who has dropped out. We've had several different people who have dropped out of the race at this point, but they might nonetheless still be, still be on that ballot. ballot. Exactly. Now, if you've early voted, you can go up to what I believe it is, what, three days before the primary and go and ask for a new ballot and, re and recast. But again, a lot of people may not know that. They won't know that. Or not be in a position. They should watch this program. That's right, they should. <laughs> or, or maybe the reason why they early voted was why? They were out of town. Um, they were anticipating, I don't know, maybe I'll make up something, surgery or, or who knows, they have, they have family duties. And so they may be casting a vote for somebody um, who is essentially really not running anymore, um, who who's suspended right, their campaigns. Right. Yeah. And, and lose the, the effect of, of that vote. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. This is a case where maybe something like what? Ranked choice voting would have come in nicely, where you could have sort of said, well, my first choice is so-and-so, second choice, third choice, and if your first choice is dropped out of the race, maybe we, they could set up something so it would be transferred to somebody who's still actually um, actively seeking the nomination. Yeah. Some of the municipalities have used or are using that ranked voting process, but, right. but it's not in place for this particular uh, election. Correct, correct. Anything else uh, our viewers should know about the, uh, the primary voting coming up here on March 3rd before we talk about some other aspects of politics? Sure, I think the other thing to understand here is that Minnesota is coming on Super Tuesday. Super Tuesday is when approximately 34% of all the delegates will be selected. And Super Tuesdays is enormous because you've got Minnesota, Massachusetts, Texas, California, Arkansas. Uh, uh, I'm forgetting all the different states. It's 14 different states. And so this is big because if a candidate does really well on Super Tuesday, that's going to put him or her in a really good position. And this brings us back to our Michael Bloomberg issue, because when Michael Bloomberg entered the race, um, he's, he's worth, let's say, quite a bit of money. Uh, a six, few billion. A few billion, $65 billion. I'm going to tell a joke about this in a second here. Um, it's hard for candidates to be able to run effective campaigns in all these different states and have the money. The, the, the belief was that Bloomberg had the resources to do it, which he does, and that had he done really well in the Nevada debate, that combined with all his spending and advertising would have put him in a very important position in Super Tuesday. After his miserable debate performance, this is yet yet, yet to be um, determined. Now, okay, now I got to tell you my quick story here. I love this one. So, I was giving a talk about about a month, not even a month ago, about three weeks ago, to some group, and I was talking about Michael Bloomberg and his money, and I said, well, you can do an awful lot of money when you're worth $55 billion. And someone corrected me and said, Professor Schultz, you're wrong. I said, what part am I wrong about? And they said, he's worth $65 billion. Um, in the last, apparently, six months, his wealth went up by $10 billion. Um, so in the time that he has spent $400 million on his presidential campaign, his net wealth has nonetheless still increased by $10 billion. Only in America, right? Oh, it's amazing. Um, <laughs> And again, just putting this in perspective also, Barack Obama in 2008, his campaign alone raised $1 billion. And that was the largest for any presidential campaign ever in American history for a candidate. We're not talking about like political action committees and others. Bloomberg has said he'll spend whatever it takes. Let's say he spends 2 or $3 billion on his campaign. That's still what, barely what? maybe 5% of his total net wealth at that point. Uh, 
he's in a position of basically spending more money than has ever been spent by any candidate in American history. Wouldn't that be uh, an inauspicious precedent that someone had the ability to spend whatever amount of money it takes to get elected and they do get elected? Yeah. What kind of precedence does that set for the next election? Well, what it's going to say is that, especially when the contest could be between two billionaires, uh, that what's it telling us about the scope of democracy in America or the scope of how important money is in our political system? Exactly. Yeah. Um, and it's not a good sign. It's not a good sign where now we seem to be having a presidential campaign about billionaires. We also know, just to reinforce this, that the New York Times did a piece on this once in the last presidential election. There's only about 200 donors in the United States that matter. They account for well over 90% of all the money um, contributed in the, um, in the American political system. When you and I send $25 off to our favorite candidate, that's quaint, that's nice, mm. but the real big donors are spending you know, millions and millions of dollars. And Bernie doesn't want any of it. Doesn't want any <laughs> of it, and, and guess what? He's, he's raised more money than any other, any other Democratic Party candidate this year. I didn't say he has the most money, that's Bloomberg, but he's raised more most, money. Yeah. Um, and he's done it all with small donations, um, oftentimes as little as what? $2.70. Amazing. Yeah. Another interesting point. Yeah. Let's, let's talk uh, a little bit about another candidate, a, a favorite uh, hometown lady, yeah. a Senator Amy Klobuchar. Um, what do you think her prospects are? What does her future hold for? for her uh, going forward. It's interesting because she came in fifth in Iowa, came in third in New Hampshire, and everybody declares her a winner. Uh, it's kind of, for me, it's kind of hard to say fifth and third equals winner, but she is one of, I'm gonna describe as part of one of three factions in the Democratic Party right now. Faction one is the Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, more progressive wing. Faction two is a, is a conglomeration of moderates, Buttigieg, Klobuchar, and, and Biden. And then I actually put Bloomberg in the th a third faction of the party. Yeah. Um, yeah. But if I throw him into the moderates, um, she is along with three other moderates, if I, again, if I include Ber Bloomberg, fighting for sort of to, to consolidate support on the moderate wing of the party. Um, she got a decent bump from the debate in New Hampshire, uh, but she's run well, or, I don't know, she's run somewhat well, depending on what somewhat is, fifth mm -hmm. and third, in two incredibly white states. Polls are suggesting that she doesn't resonate in Nevada and South Carolina, uh, the next two states, which have high percentages of people of color. And her challenge is now going to be to figure out how does she take whatever momentum she has and convert that over and being able to expand her base and speak to people of color uh, and also nationwide expand her base because she's still two, three, four percent in the national polls. She's got a lot of work to do. She has an incredible amount of work to do and I think what she has is, is a lot of challenges going ahead because again it's Nevada, it's South Carolina, then it's Super Tuesday um, and it's not clear she has the resources to compete at that point. So it, unless something dramatically changes, let's say in the next week or so, um, by the time the dust clears on Super Tuesday, um, her campaign um, may be pretty weak, but we don't know. Well, let's wish her well. Yes. In the few moments that we have left, uh, Professor, uh, tell us about this new book that you have out, Presidential Swing States, Why Only 10 Matter. Uh, in other words, there are 10 states that are going to elect the next president. Mm -hmm. what's, what's your book all about? Well, what my book is about, and I'm going to amend that number in a minute here, okay. What that book is about is the fact that we know well in advance of presidential elections how many states are going to vote. We know, for example, because of the Electoral College, California, New York, um, Massachusetts are going to vote reliably Democrat for the Democratic Party. Places like Texas, like, like Louisiana, places like Alabama, reliably Republican. Uh, when we first wrote the book, our calculation was there were only 10 states in play. Those 10 states were going to decide the outcome of the election because there were what? There were 40 states that were either solidly Democrat, solidly Republican, and neither party had the 270 electoral votes to win. We've changed that argument now. 
it's not 10 states, it's six states. Six, six states. Six, six states are going to decide the election because right now my calculation is Democrats or any Democratic candidate has 222 electoral votes. Donald Trump has 216. It's pretty close. There's a, six states, which include Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Michigan, Wisconsin, and Minnesota, and Florida. Those are the six states that matter at this point. And those are the six swing states. So think about this. A handful of people in six states are going to determine the next president of the United States. Now, I'll make this even better. There's a little bit of a joke here. We know in each of the swing states, there are also a swing county that really decides everything. Yeah. In the state of Wisconsin, whoever wins Brown County, which is where Green Bay is, generally wins Wisconsin. Many people are arguing, including me, Wisconsin may decide the presidential election. If that's true, and if Brown County decides Wisconsin, do you know what that means? Packers fans are going to decide the next president of the United <laughs> States. Well, that would be interesting. It would be. Yes. It would be. Yes. Vikings fans will not like that, but Packers fans <laughs> will. Uh, one last topic before we, uh, we, we get to the end here. Uh, headline in today's paper said that Russia was interfering in the election on behalf of Trump again. What's going on? Well, with the exception of Donald Trump, I think everybody in the United States knows or reasonably believes that Russia um, is, is using what? Social media and other mechanisms to try to influence the election. So this doesn't surprise me at all um, that, that Russia got away with it once four years ago and the president seems to be um, unwilling or un, um, to, to recognize it or doesn't want to recognize it because he believes it, believes it questions his legitimacy. But yes, look to see this. And, and if I can say one thing to everybody watching out here, if I can give one bit of advice, if you see something on Facebook, something in Twitter, something in the social media that looks too good to be true or it looks very strange, ignore it. And more importantly, if you want to make sure that the Russians and the bots aren't spreading fake news, real simple answer. Don't repost anything. Exactly. Don't pass it on. Don't pass, Don't it, pass on. it on. Yeah, this is, this is a medical model here. Don't pass on infectious <laughs> diseases. Don't pass on infectious social media. Well, it's something that everybody needs to be aware of because there's going to be a lot of it out this, this time around, I think. Uh, correct. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Well, our guest has been uh, Professor David Schultz with Hamline University talking about 2020 elections. Uh, there's a lot more to talk about, but we certainly appreciate the... A limited time you've had with us today and sharing your insights and your experience. It's been delightful. It's Thank always you. my Thank pleasure, you, Professor. Always my pleasure.